Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this 20th century fiction NPTEL course where we'll begin with a new text today which is Kathy Mansfield's short story The Fly. We just finished Ulysses by James Joyce and move on from there into um, um, a shorter uh, structure, a shorter, a shorter text which is this particular story The Fly. Now before I dive into the text, just a little background about the story I think is uh, in order. Uh, this is essentially a story about the First World War, uh, although the war is never really mentioned, I mean it just comes as a very, very a tacit uh, and uh, oblique presence, but it is very much there as some kind of a spectral presence, a spectral field as it were, uh, informing the characters, informing the action, informing the events of this particular story. Now, uh, one of the key things about the story is, as is the case with most Mansfield stories, and she's one of the greatest writers of the short fiction, is what gets uh, told is something uh, is sometimes less important than what doesn't get told, right? So, you know, we need to pay a very close attention to the things which are not being said, things which are hinted, things which are insinuated, things which are very obliquely referred to. Uh, and oftentimes things which are told directly or talked about directly are just, uh, you know, cover-ups for things which are don't, uh, characters don't want to discuss or don't want to confront. Uh, and it's this whole tension between what is told and what is not told is one of the great masteries uh, in, a, uh, in, in writing short fiction in terms of making, uh, you know, what we call the economy of expression that, you know, you can say so much by uh, showing so little, by telling so little, right? So, you know, showing and not telling becomes important as well. So, Mansfield is a great artist in that tradition. I mean, she obviously is, like I mentioned, one of the greatest short story writers in the history of English literature. But also, I think what makes her particularly interesting as a writer, especially in this case, is how she uh, is so uh, reflective of 20th century fiction in terms of looking at human consciousness, in terms of looking at human memory, in terms of looking at epiphany, and also in terms of the entire uh, condensed structure of communication, the condensed communication, where we sort of crystallize different moments together uh, in some kind of a literary alchemy, and then it produced this magnificent effect. Uh, the effect could be one of mourning, the effect could be one of loss, the effect could be one of epiphany, etc. Now, this particular story uh, is one of the shortest short stories that ever come by. Uh, but, you know, despite its brevity, uh, it is actually a very, very complex short story. It is packed with different things, uh, different kinds of moods, different kinds of affective tenors. Uh, and also, uh, the whole idea behind the short story about, uh, you know, endurance is, because, is, is very, very important. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, the First World War uh, is never really talked about directly, except in, in a very, very oblique reference. But it is very much there as a spectral presence. It is like a ghostly presence behind uh, everything that happens in the story. Now, the other thing which we need to pay attention to in the short story is the idea of superficiality. Uh, so we have some very superficial structures of strength, superficial structures of solidity, uh, superficial structures of uh, supremacy, etc., which are there uh, as constructs, which are very, very uh, quickly deconstructed, very, very quickly decimated. And then so what emerges in the short story very quickly is the idea of existential fragility. So fragility becomes very, very important in a way. Uh, and the whole idea of strength and supremacy they appear as very superficial categories. And the superficiality is important, especially at the beginning of the short story, where we find that how a certain kind of affective mood, a certain kind of affective architecture is being uh, very forcibly uh, constructed, or very forcibly foregrounded. Uh, but what it's actually there beneath all the artificiality and superficiality is a very fractured, fragile self. Uh, and the fractured, fragile quality of the fragility is something which we, are, you know, we should pay close attention to. And again, this fragility is obviously a psychological slash existential condition, but at the same time, it's often uh, also uh, inform a material condition. So the materiality of fragility is something which we also should keep in mind. Now, uh, among other things, this is also a short story which would interest those of you who uh, are keen 
on research and masculinity, especially post war masculinity. Uh, so, the whole idea of masculinity, the whole idea of the male body uh, as something which is uh, robust, something which is healthy, something which is productive, uh, something obviously which uh, corresponds to a sense of supremacy are all hinted at uh, very, very closely in this uh, uh, particular story. But at the same time, uh, again, like I mentioned, uh, what gets very quickly revealed is the idea of fragility, is the idea of the fractured self, which is something which keeps coming up despite the superficiality of. Uh, supremacy, the superficiality of uh, supreme, uh, 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 characteristically uh, uh, controlled masculinity or controlling masculinity, a coercive masculinity. So, uh, there is a character called the boss in this short story and uh, interestingly and appropriately it is never named, we never know, you get to know the name of the character except that he is called the boss all the time. And obviously, the bossness of his character is a marker of his supremacy, is a marker of his dominance, is a marker of his love to dominate. Uh, over everything and uh, as a market for his supremacy or superiority uh, apropos of his surrounding people. And this supremacy and, super, you know, and, and superiority is obviously part of this manly masculinist package which is embodying very, very clearly. So, the story opens with uh, the boss and the boss is obviously contrasted with someone who is just the opposite, someone who is already fragile, someone who is already mm, essentially decimated, someone who is already senile, someone who is already beginning to lose memory etc. So, this pitching is important right. So, the boss against the other person uh, that contrast is very, very important and that is something which we will pay attention to as we move on. So, with that background in mind and there is another background as well which we should bear in mind although I am not a big fan of biographical readings. But there is a very valid criticism, there is a very valid scholarship which says that this particular story is often uh, in a Mansfield drew on her own experiences uh, you know, of having lost uh, her own, uh, own brother Leslie Mansfield uh, you know, in, that, in, 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 in the first world war. And the, uh, the, the boss in this particular story the fly is often said to be drawn on Mansfield's own father. Uh, you know, again, someone who is uh, apparently very, very domineering and a complete patriarch. Uh, and the patriarchal quality of the boss is important uh, because he seems to be the embodiment of high patriarchy, high handed patriarchy. Uh, and obviously, the entire story is told from a feminist perspective, although there are no women at all in the story, which is interesting. The women are a very conspicuous presence, uh, conspicuous absence, sorry, in the story, except when they are mentioned a couple of times. Uh, as minor characters, as uh, secondary and even tertiary characters, right? But they are very much there despite their absence in the story, they are very much there around the story. Uh, so, that the whole perspective becomes important and the men who inhabit the center of the story, they actually end up being uh, decimated, they end up being uh, quite fragile as we see in due course. But let us look at the opening of the story and the opening as I mentioned uh, it carries this deceptive sense of superiority, this deceptive sense of supremacy which is very quickly revealed to be fragile and uh, superficial in quality. So, here we are uh, the fly Catherine Mansfield and the opening of the story is thus and this should be on your screen. You are very snug in here piped old Mr. Woodyfield and, and, and peered out of his great green leather armchair by his friend the boss's desk as a baby pierced out of his pram. So, the entire uh, focalization as it were uh, the character through which uh, through its perspective the entire story is revealed at the beginning uh, opened up at the beginning is a character called Mr. Woodyfield. And uh, Woodyfield we are told is sitting in this great green leather armchair. So, the armchair is important and it is looking at the boss and it is complimenting the boss in this comfortable situation. You are very snug in here piped old Mr. Woodyfield and peered out of his great green leather armchair by his friend the boss's desk as a baby peers out of his pram. And the last image is important we find that increasingly Woodyfield is infantilized and infantilization of Woodyfield is indicated by the different baby images, the baby metaphors that he is equated with. So, the uh, great green leather armchair that he is sitting in uh, seems to be too big for him and is having to peer out of it as a baby peers out of his pram later. Right, so, the baby image is important and this obviously uh, is equating a senility with infantilization. His talk was over, it was time for him to be off, but he did not want to go. Since he had retired, since his stroke, his wife and the girls kept him boxed up in the house every day of the week except Tuesday. So, we are told we are given some background information about Whitfield that since he retired and since he had a stroke, so obviously he has been socially and biologically uh, you know, dysfunctional for a long time because he is retired, he cannot make any more money, he is not productive anymore, socially speaking, professionally speaking. So, his professional productivity is gone and at the same time we are told he has had a stroke which is to say he is biologically also unproductive, he is biologically also quite unhealthy. So, he is essentially 
someone who's just waiting to, to, to die, he's waiting to come to an end. He's got nothing to offer in terms of professional productivity and also in terms of his biological health. Right? So since the stroke, his wife and his girls kept him boxed up in a house every day of the week except Tuesday. So we are told again that he's boxed up in the house, he's confined in the house. And this uh, whole idea of being confined is important because what it does is it reverses entire gender dynamics away. Because we know for a long time the confinement was a very standard quote unquote medical cure for female hysterics. And female hysterics would be confined to their houses. Uh, obviously, my male doctors, you would look at hysteria as a female malady. So the whole idea of confinement is reversed away, right? And that becomes an important reversal. So, uh, so he, he's confined in his house uh, every day of the week except Tuesday by his wife and his daughters. So on Tuesday, he was dressed and brushed and allowed to cut back to the city for the day. So again, look at the verbs. He was dressed and brushed. It's like a child would be dressed and brushed. So again, this whole infantilization of Woody Field is uh, con continuing over here. So he is dressed and brushed and is allowed to be cut back to the city for the day. So the word allowed is important because it is often equated with agency. Uh, so whoever allows something often obviously has agency. So if I allow someone to do something, it means I have the agency, which I'm conferring to the other person. So the wife and the girls over here seems to have the agency to allow Woody Field to do something which is otherwise forbidden to do. So what is he allowed to do? He's allowed to cut back to the city for the day. He's, he's allowed to come to the city for one day of the week, which is Tuesday, and this happens to be a Tuesday as well. Although what he did there, the wife and the girls couldn't imagine, made a nuisance of himself to his friends, the supposed. Well, perhaps so. All the same, we cling to our last pleasures as a tree clings to its last leaves. So again, the tree metaphor is important as a dying tree. Uh, clinging on to his last leaves. So what he feels is increasingly and consistently equated with a dying organism, with something coming to an end. So the senility of what he feels is something which is emphasized over and over again. So he's equated with a dying tree which is clinging on to his last leaves. In the same way, he's a dying man who's clinging on to his last pleasures. And, and this would be you know, coming and seeing his old friends in the city. Okay, so there's that old Woody Field uh, smoking a cigar and staring almost greedily at the boss who rolled in his office chair, stout, rosy, five years older than him and still going strong, still at the helm. It did one good to see him, right? So again, the whole idea of uh, uh, the boss uh, is, uh, is projected in front of Woodyfield and we see the boss for the first time through Woodyfield's eyes. Uh, how does the boss look like? Uh, so there's that old Woodyfield and he's looking greedily at the boss. So he's also has greedy gaze on the boss because he seems to be healthier and rosier and more stout than Woodyfield despite being five years older than him. And this becomes interesting because biological age over here seems to have nothing to do with uh, the social age that the boss seems to enjoy and the social age of privilege. He's obviously in a very privileged position and what you feel in contrast is in a very, very uh, underprivileged position because he was ill held. Right. It did one good to see him. Wistfully, admiringly, the old voice added, it's snug in here upon the wood. So again, snug being comfortable, so he's complimented the boss over and over again on his comfortable location. And obviously the comfortable location is not just a physical location, but also the social location, right? So the boss seems to be you know, socially situated in a very comfortable and privileged place. You know, the, the fact that he's called the boss uh, is indicative of that. Yes, it's comfortable enough, agreed the boss, and he flipped the financial times with a paper knife. So again, this whole idea of flipping open the financial times with a paper knife becomes a very robust, manly maneuver. He's opening the financial times with one you know, swoop of the paper knife one cut of the paper knife and obviously the Financial Times becomes in, in, as a newspaper for financial information, as a newspaper for the share market. So it's a very, very quote unquote manly newspaper. It's what men read because men make money and men invest, men invest money on different shares and men control the market. So the whole idea of uh, the masculine consumption uh, becomes important over here with the arrival of the Financial Times. And obviously the paper knife with which he opens it up is a very phallic instrument. So he opens the uh, Financial Times with a paper knife. As a matter of fact, uh, he was proud of his room. He liked to have it admired, especially by old Woodfield. It gave him a feeling of deep, solid satisfaction to be planted there in the midst of it, in full view of the frail old figure in the muffler. So again, Woodfield becomes a very um, um, uh, handy contrast to the boss, a very handy visual contrast to the boss. 
because what he's saying is, and in comparison to Woodfield, he feels very big, he feels very amplified, he feels very magnified, and that amplification and magnification is something which is obviously feeding his male ego, his masculine sense of privilege. So it feel, he feels great, it gives him a sense of solid satisfaction, almost tangible, almost tactile uh, sense of satisfaction in comparison to the frail old figure in the muffler, which is obviously a very, uh, it's, it's, it looks like a mummy. It, it's, he's someone, it's an almost zombie-like, would you feel? He's frail, he's old, he's almost shrunken into his muffler, and the muffler becomes more important than his face, which is to say he's literally shrunken in size, biologically speaking. And compared to which, uh, the boss is a uh, stout, rosy, healthy, and he enjoys a position of difference, which is also a position of privilege. So it's privilege which is, gen is generated out of difference compared to Woodyfield. I've had it done up lately, he explained, as he'd explained for the past how many weeks. So again, uh, he's beginning to now tell what he's done to the office in terms of repairing it. New carpet, and he pointed to the bright red carpet with a pattern of large white rings. New furniture and he nodded towards the massive bookcase and a table with, with legs that twisted trickle. Electric heating. He waved almost exultantly towards the five transparent pearly sausages glowing so softly in the tilted copper pan. So he's showing off his new furniture, new gadgets, new carpet, new furniture, electric heating. Obviously he's surrounding himself with a lot of comfort, a lot of material comfort, but also an equally this sense of being comfortable, this sense of comfort or comfortable location is very much a part of his embodiment of the boss. So embodiment in the story could be seen as something which is obviously biological, he's stout and rosy and healthy compared to Woodfield, but also it's something more social and more extended. He's got new furniture, he's got new heating, he's got new and a bookcase around him, he's got and everything is around him is new and a carpet too is new and all the newness around him gives him an architecture of uh, superiority, an architecture of uh, an embodiment of privilege, an embodiment of superiority and, and, and obviously um, uh, strength compared to Woodyfield. It's a very relative kind of an embodiment, but that's something he's enjoying compared to Woodyfield. But he did not draw old Woodyfield's attention to the photograph of an, over a table of a grave looking boy in a uniform standing in one of the spectral photographer's parks with photographer's storm clouds behind him. It was not new. It had been there for over six years. Again, so the whole idea of the butt becomes important because the butt is a reversal of what we've seen so far. So till this point, we are told the boss is surrounding himself with new gadgets, new furniture, new heating, new bookcase, etc. But there is a big but, and that is he's not drawing Woodyfield's attention to something else in his room, which is presumably not new. And it's a grave looking boy's photograph, a photograph of a grave looking boy in uniform, standing in one of the spectral photographer's box with photographer's storm clouds behind him. So again, the word spectral becomes important as a ghostly quality bothered photograph, as a spectral quality bothered photograph, which is to say this becomes an indicator of deadness to a certain extent, something which is dead, something which lives as a specter at the moment. And uh, the boy we're told is a grave looking boy in a uniform, so it's a soldier's uniform that he's wearing uh, and obviously you know the, the gravity, the seriousness of the boy is also compounded and there's a bit of a pun over here. The grave looking boy, we could also read it as the boy is looking towards the grave, grave looking, looking towards the grave as in a deadly kind of a thing. It, it smacks of death, it smacks of decadence, it smacks of something which is exhausted and enervated, right? Uh, and obviously the word spectral corroborates that reading, corroborates that. Uh, you know, a death like quality about the photograph. Uh, we also told it was not new, it had been there for over six years. So that's something which is a bit of an oddity in this office where everything else seems to be very, very new and very, very done up, right? And compared to that done up office, he has this one photograph which is six year old photograph, and it's a photograph of a boy uh, looking very grave in a, in a soldier's uniform in a spectral photographer's spa. So we can see already how uh, Mansfield is using an economy of expression in terms of looking at certain objects uh, and how uh, communicating how these objects stand for certain things. So the newness, the new uh, materials of newness, the markers of newness around the boss, the obviously objects of acquisition, objects of privilege, objects of, objects of superiority, an entire sentiment of superiority is embedded in all these objects, is strewn across all these objects. And compared to that, we have the photograph of the boy, which is obviously um, not a marker of superiority. We don't quite know at this point what it stands for, but we do know that it's something the boss is not really showing off. It is something odd about the photograph and its location in that particular office. Uh, and the reason why the boss is not showing up will be revealed to us in a moment. Uh, there was something I wanted to tell you. 
said old Woodyfield, and his eyes grew dim remembering. Now what was it? I had him in mind when I started out this morning. His hands began to tremble and patches of red showed above his bed. So again, Woodyfield wants to say something to the boss, but the senility of Woodyfield is making his presence felt in a very heavy-handed way. And his, uh, his hands then began to tremble and patches of red are showing above his bed. So again, uh, the whole process of remembering becomes a very strenuous activity, very stressful activity for Woodyfield. So it's, when it's trying to remember something, what it ends up doing is shivering and acting very, very senile, and his hands are beginning to tremble. Uh, so he tells the boss there's something he wanted to tell him, but he's forgotten about it now, and he's trying to remember what that is. Now look at the gaze of the boss away. The boss gazes at Woodyfield in a very condescending, patronizing way, and this is what he thinks. Poor old chap, he's on his last pins, thought the boss. And feeling kindly, he winked at the old man and said jokingly. So this is a very masculinist, uh, patriarchal, uh, in a boy scoutish kind of a rhetorical way. Uh, when you feel pity for someone who's not uh, physically strong, someone who's not physically healthy, right? And you immediately infer that a boy, the person is about to die. If you're an old man, uh, not in control of your motor mechanism, it means you're on your last pins. It means you're about to die very, very shortly. And the whole idea is conveyed to us in a very condescending way, almost a humorous way. Uh, but obviously the boss will try and continue to be condescending, and this is what he will do subsequently in order to feel more manly compared to Woodyfield. Uh, so he, ring, he winked at the old man and said jokingly, what does it say? I'll tell you what, I've got a little drop of something here that will do you good before you go out into the cold again. It's beautiful stuff. It wouldn't hurt a child. So he's offering Woodyfield alcohol. It's offering Woodyfield a beverage of alcohol, and he says this is going to do you a lot of good. So if, before you go out and step out into this cold world outside, have a drop of this before you leave. It wouldn't hurt a child. Again, the child metaphor is important, but Woodyfield is constantly uh, compared to a child. It's constantly equated with a child metaphor, which is obviously part of his infantilization package. Okay, so, um, and what does the boss do subsequently? He took a key off his watch chain, unlocked a cupboard below his desk, and drew forth a dark, squat table. That's medicine, said he, and the man from whom I got it told me on a strict QT. It came from the castle uh, cellars at Windsor Castle. So it, this is a bottle of whiskey which has come from the Windsor Castle. Obviously, it becomes a marker of privilege, a marker of royalty, a marker of very... Uh, uh, limited access, right? So the boss seems to have a lot of access over things which other people may have limited access to. So this becomes the whole idea of access and privilege uh, become interestingly equated with each other in this particular section. So he's got it from a Windsor Castle, and it's presumably this is a very, very old bottle of whiskey that he's about to offer to Woodyfield. Old Woodyfield's mouth fell open at the sight. He couldn't have produced, he couldn't have looked more surprised if the boss had produced a rabbit. So again, the whole idea of awe and wonder and amazement is conveyed to us in almost a very uh, funny way. Uh, Woodyfield's mouth fell open at the side and it, it seems to be him and at this point of time the boss had produced a rabbit, right, uh, pulled a rabbit off his hat. Uh, so whiskey is as rare to him, whiskey is as forbidden to him, whiskey is as privileged to him uh, compared to seeing you know, a rabbit pull out of a hat, that would be a magic trick, and so to Woodyfield this too is a form of magic in some sense. It's whiskey, aren't it? He piped feebly. The boss turned the bottle and lovingly showed him the label. Whiskey it was. So again, like the Financial Times, like the paper knife, like the electric heating, like the bookcase, uh, like the new furniture, the new carpets, uh, the whiskey bottle over here too becomes a marker of boss's masculinity. A uh, very privileged, consolidated, strong, robust masculinity. And the robustness of the masculinity is interesting over here because that's exactly what will be portrayed now and then decimated later. So uh, it's whiskey haunted, he piped feebly. The boss turned the bottle and lovingly showed him the label, whiskey it was. Do you know, said he, pouring up, uh, peering up at the boss uh, wonderingly, they won't let me touch it at home. And it looked as, uh, looked as, if, as though he was going to cry. So again, the whole idea of complaining about the woman, the woman are forbidding him from drinking whiskey. The woman take away uh, all access to whiskey. The woman take away all access to his outside world, which is obviously a reversal of the gender dynamics which is commonly consumed across the world, where men control things over women. But this is what the First World War does. The First World War, historically, it destabilized the demographic equation, the demographic uh, map of Europe in particular, because suddenly at the end of the world, there were very few young men left, or rather there were very few able young men left. So most people even come back from the war 
uh, they became differently able, they became um, you know, paralyzed in different degrees, they, they couldn't function properly. So women uh, began to take up more agency in social and familial spaces after the First World War. And we see over here, and we'll see continually as the story progresses, what if it was a daughter, and what daughters and why they seem to have, they seem to enjoy more real privilege and more real agency compared to what if it was even the boss. Okay, so they don't allow Woodyfield to touch whiskey at home. Okay, um, and he looked as though he was going to cry. So again, the baby metaphor is important, the baby, uh, you know, the analogy is important. He's someone who's looking as if he's going to cry in a moment. Ah, that's where we know a bit more than a ladies, cried the boss, swooping down across the two tumblers that stood on the table with the, with the water bottle and pouring a generous finger into each. So again, look at the very offensive and patronizing statement that Boss makes about women in general. And he says, oh, the women don't let you touch whiskey at home. That's where we know more than a lady. That's where we know this is a medicine, right? So we know it's a medicine because, uh, you know, it's a manly thing to acknowledge and talk about. So the woman forbidding Woodyfield from drinking, they are completely sidelined over here. And what instead emerges is the boss's agency of giving him the whiskey and Woodyfield consuming, not just the whiskey, but also the boss's superiority. That is also been consumed by Woodyfield at this point. Okay, uh, drink it down, it'll do you good, and don't put any water in it. It's sacrilege to tamper with stuff like this, right? So he's trying, he's being a canosa of whiskey and he's saying, don't put in water in this whiskey because that's going to dilute everything and that'll be amount to sacrilege, so don't drink whiskey at all. Okay, um, except if you're drinking it on directly. So drink it down, it'll do you good, and don't put any water in it. It's a sacrilege to tamper with the stuff like this. Ah, he, he tossed up his, puffed up his handkerchief, hastily wiped his moustaches and cocked an eye and cocked a crooked eye and Woodyfield's attention and Woodyfield who was rolling in his last pin. Now this cocked an eye is interesting because this, you can see it's a very uh, boy scoutish kind of a movement that the boss is exhibiting away. It's very manly, robust, boy, sprightly, energetic, he's cocking an eye, uh, he's hastily drinking down his whiskey and he pulled his handkerchief and hastily wiped his moustache. So all his motor movements at this point of time are very, very robust and sprightly in quality and he's cocking the eye at what would you feel and his cocking the eye is important because it's almost like winking uh, in a very clean Easterish kind of a way. Uh, and, a, and a very manly, robust, uh, masculinist kind of a movement that the boss is exhibiting. And obviously Woodyfield uh, is just the opposite of that. He's senile, he's weak, he's not robust at all. And he's exhibiting weakness, right? So we have this weak man compared to this strong man who's obviously exhibiting great masculine strength and also social privilege, right? And that becomes, so the whiskey becomes a metaphor of a certain kind of consumption, manly consumption. And just before this, when we see that a boss uh, very condescendingly saying and the, the, the wife and daughters, they don't seem to know much about whiskey and, and drinking and alcohol and that's good for men because we know more than ladies about in that, in that particular respect. So that too becomes a very condescending offensive statement of superiority, which is in continuation of the masculinist narrative that the boss is exhibiting, the form of embodiment which is offensive, dominating and all-knowing uh, to a large extent. The old man swallowed, was silent a moment and then said faintly, it's nutty. But it warned him. It crept into his chill old brain, he remembered. So this becomes a turning point in the story where the boss offers Woodyfield whiskey and Woodyfield drinks down the whiskey, but then that reminds him of what he wanted to tell the boss at the beginning of the story. And this is the beginning of the turning point, the reversal, as it were, in the story. Well, that was it, he said, heaving himself out of his chair. And this is a report he wanted to give to the boss. So what is a report? But it's going to turn the entire story around in terms of mood and sentiment. I thought you'd like to know. The girls were in Belgium last week having a look at poor Reggie's grave and happened to come across your boys. They're quite near each other, it seems. So the girls, meaning the wife and the daughters, were in Belgium uh, last week, Woodyfield tells us, and they were taking a look at poor Reggie's grave. So Reggie presumably is, is a son of Woodyfield who died in the First World War. And while they're looking at Reg Reggie's grave, they happened to come by the boss's son's grave. Uh, and they're quite near each other, it seems. Now, just a bit of a digression over here. It's interesting to know that you know the entire first world war, the experience of the first world war, when the war ended, uh, we had something which is now called, in a slightly uh, unfortunate way, trauma tourism. In the sense that people would go to different places where their near and dear ones were buried and lost their lives across Europe and visit that place, visit a graveyard, visit the uh, monument uh, which wrote down the names, etc. So trauma tourism was a big thing after the First World War, which the war itself was a big boom to the tourism industry because everyone wanted to travel post First World War and look at the places where the war was fought, historically important, and also more personally look at the places where people lost their loved ones, you know, people who 
lost their uh, loved ones in different places across Europe, they would just visit those places as some form of respect giving uh, to the people who died. So that also became, uh, worked wonders, uh, as it were, for tourism industry. And they all boomed around this time of the, uh, in human history after the First World War. So and also you can see how the, the wife uh, and the girls have travel on their own without any male chaperone, without any male supervision, without any male monitoring. So again, that tells us something about the liberation, the, the movement, the mobility uh, and as associated agency enjoyed by women after the First World War. And compared to which we have the two men, one of them is boxed up in this uh, house every day with except Tuesday and the other person the boss, he's uh, essentially locked himself in his very, very posh and magnificent office. Right, so we see how that, did, that gets uh, expanded uh, quickly. So they're quite near each other, it seems. Old Woodyfield paused, but the boss made no reply. Only a quiver in his eyelids showed that he had heard. So again, uh, Mansfield is uh, good at something which we now call uh, not just defamiliarization, by which you defamiliarize something which you know already, but also deceleration, slowing down in time, suspension in time. So, you know, the whole idea, the boss responding to Woodyfield through a uh, little movement in his eye, a uh, little quiver in his eyelid, so that becomes important. It's almost like the camera zooms in and the quiver of the eyelid of the boss and communicates to us that the quiver is happening, which means he's responding uh, to Woodyfield's uh, report, posthumous report of the boss's uh, son's grave. So only a quiver in his eyelids showed that he had heard. The girls were delighted with the way the place is kept, piped the old voice, beautifully looked after. Couldn't be better if they were at home. We have not been across, have we? So again, the whole idea of the sublimity of horror becomes important because obviously the horror is the horror of loss in the beloved ones. But you know, the entire horror side has been aestheticized and the aestheticization of horror, the aestheticization of the trauma uh, topos, that obviously becomes part of the trauma tourism where people go and consume uh, the uh, death of the beloved ones in very aestheticized sites uh, of consumption. So it's all beautifully looked after, it's almost like a hotel resort where all the dead people are put together in one mass of symmetry. Could be better if they were at home. You haven't been across, have you? No, no. For various reasons, the boss had not been across. Again, look at the vagueness of the statement. For various reasons, the boss had not been across. So, you know, we never quite know at this point why the boss had not traveled. We'll get to know why in, in due course. But we're told at this point the boss didn't really bother to go all the way. So, he hasn't been there at the site of his son's grave. Okay. Uh, for various reasons, the boss had not been across. There are miles of it quavered old Winterfield, and it's all as neat as a garden. Uh, flowers growing on all the graves, nice broad parts. It was plain from his voice how much he liked a nice broad part. So again, we look at the aestheticization, the sublimity of the entire horror side. We have like nice broad parts set up. We have everything put together, manufactured and manicured like a garden. Uh, there's a garden growing around the graves, which is obviously very manicured in quality. So it's manicured quality, the orchestrated quality, the aestheticized quality. They all inform the trauma tourism, the trauma narrative, which is at play over here. Okay, uh, the post came again, then an old man brightened wonderfully. Do you know what the hotel made the girls pay for a pot of jam? He piped, 10 francs robbery, I call it. It was a little pot too, as Gertrude says, no bigger than half a crown, and she hadn't taken more than a spoonful when they charged her 10 francs. Gertrude brought away the pot, brought the pot away to teach them a lesson. Uh, quite right too, it's trading on our feelings. The thing because we are over there having a look around, we are ready to pay anything, that's what it is. And it turned towards the door. So again, if you look at the rhetoric way, it's a very touristy rhetoric. One tourist mentioned this to another tourist or another potential tourist. Be careful of what you eat because you end up being overcharged quite um, you know, rapidly over there. So he's saying you know, they had to pay 10 francs for a very, very decent meal, uh, very modest meal as well. And you know, they also made them uh, you know, uh, buy the pot of jam you know, because they just used it one spoon and as a result, uh, you know, Gertrude brought back the jam. He, she just caught it back because she paid for it. So the pettiness of it, the very touristy quality of the whole experience where you go and get overcharged because you're using some things and as an act of revenge, you just 
take away some things which are used, which are meant to be returned to the hotel. So he, she brought back this wave, this, this pot of jam, in a way, to take revenge on the hotel. And, you know, this discussion about the price of jam in Belgium becomes important because we don't really see any accounts of horror. Even the graveyards of the boy and, and Woodyfield's boy and the boss's boy, they seem to be quite aestheticized. They're very beautiful, they're very sublime in quality, right? And then the rest of the conversation is entirely, the sort of monologue is entirely about, uh, you know, the the pot of jam which the girls were forced to buy. And so Gertrude brought by the whole jam to teach them a lesson. Uh, and the last bit is important to say, just because we're there uh, having a look around, that we are ready to pay anything that they think. Uh, that's what it is. And they're trading on our feelings. So, you know, the, the whole thing becomes very ironic in quality over here. Because we realize Woodyfield doesn't seem to have much of a feeling left about the son's death. Because he's more concerned talking about the price of jam. He's more concerned talking about the nice broad parts. He's more concerned talking about the aesthetic quality of the entire horror site. Right? And that becomes the, the key condition over here. And as a result of which, uh, you know, um, you know, he's, he, he just keeps talking about uh, different tourist things, different commercial things, etc., which has got nothing to do with the real experience of horror. Okay? Uh, so, you know, he says that we are ready to pay anything they think because we're just taking a look around, and that's like trading on our feelings. And it turned towards the dome. Quite right, quite right, cried the boss. Though what was quite right, he hadn't the least idea. He came round with his desk, followed the shuffling footsteps to the dome, and saw the old fellow out. Woodyfield was gone. Now, if we take a look at this point of the story, from this point we find the Woodyfield you know, departure, it begins to begin the fall of the boss in a certain sense because he is now less in control of his motor mechanism, he's less in control of his language, and he doesn't quite understand why he said such a thing as quite right, quite right. He's at a loss to figure out why he said it. Now, if you contrast that with the beginning of the story, the boss himself complete motor control, complete cognitive control over everything around them. So this, that, that particular control self or controlling self is beginning to give way to a more unstable, more vulnerable self, which we see in this particular story. So he saw the old Woodyfield out, he saw the old fellow out, Woodyfield was gone. So I'll stop at this point today and we'll continue with this in the next lectures. But just to very quickly recap what we have done, this is a story which begins by, by presenting a very, very supposedly a strong masculinist character, someone who's a bit of a patriarch, the grand old boss. Uh, which is who surrounded himself with new machines, he's obviously updated himself, he's very switched on about the new gadgets of his times, he reads the Financial Times, opens it with one swaying with a paper knife uh, and offers whiskey to a friend of his who is obviously in comparison to him, dying, comparison to him, very, very weak. And the reason why he offers whiskey is because it makes him feel better and greater and stronger. Right? So the whiskey consumption becomes a symbolic act. By offering him whiskey, by offering Woodfield whiskey and by consuming it, the boss consumes and corroborates his own masculine privilege in his own mind. He's corroborating that through an act of consumption. He's consuming his own masculine persona. Uh, and Woodfield obviously becomes a very handy contrast, a very handy ontological opposite uh, compared to that particular construct. Right? So, um, you know, and that, but at this point we see that, you know, the moment Woodyfield mentions the graveyards, the moment Woodyfield mentions the Belgium where the, where the son, the, the daughters and the wife had gone to actually pay the last respect to Reggie, Woodyfield's son's grave. Uh, and as we can see, you know, we discussed it already, he's got no feeling at all about the loss of the son and it talks about uh, the commercial entities, the, the tourist entities, which are obviously irrelevant to the boss. Uh, but what it does is, it opens up the boss, uh, it forces him to think about his own son, who too was dead, and we are told that their graves are very close to each other, Reggie's grave and the boss's son's uh, grave. Interestingly, like the boss, the son of the boss too, it doesn't have a name, which gives an everyman character to the entire, uh, everyman quality to the entire characters. So the boss is an, is an everyman patriarch, is an everyman grand old patriarch who wants to control everything, and the son over here becomes a different kind of masculinist package, which we'll see in due course of time. So I stop at this point today, and I continue with this lecture, this particular text, and hopefully finish this in a couple of more lectures. Thank you for your attention.